Hey, friend, that was Steve here. Welcome back to Ask Wrestle Juice. You guys left a bunch of great questions. Once again, let's go ahead and dive into them. A lot of you guys uh, gave the old thumbs up to this one from Blake Whitehouse. He says, would any of the men that were in Money in the Bank last year be in a better spot now than Damian Priest with the briefcase, or did it literally not matter who won? I'm going to take a look at Money in the Bank 2023 and see just how weak this field is, because if I recall, this was the one that was in London. It was a pretty weak field. It's, I th if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it felt from the outside, outset that it came down to two guys, Damian Priest and uh, L.A. Knight. Yeah, uh, but otherwise, you got Logan Paul in there, Ricochet. They had a cool spot, Santos Escobar uh, and Shinsuke Nakamura. I mean, a good spot for Santos to be in, but it was like just until very recently that Santos really started turning heads uh, on main roster. Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura, again, you know, not much more than like a high profile guy that's going to eat pins. So he wasn't realistic. Logan Paul and Ricochet at the time, neither were realistic. Uh, Butch, you know, I mean, he's in there because he makes for a good match. But at the time, especially, he was just like, you know, Seamus's henchman. Uh, and then L.A. Knight, who was pretty hot last year. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, I think a lot of us thought L.A. Knight was going to win it. And I think they sort of teased it there towards the finish. He was really hot at the time. I don't know, man. I guess in retrospect, maybe you could have done L.A. Knight wins it. And then he sort of does the uh, cash in announcement thing, which would have motivated the Saudi Arabia match, you could have done something like that. Um, with Damian Priest, I mean, geez, this was this was a this was in what was this? 2023. This was in July of 2023. Man, I don't know. Yeah, I kind of feel like at the time Triple H was probably in a spot where Damian Priest was probably his guy, but Vince McMahon was probably still around and still had his say. I don't know if any of these other guys had had the had the money in the bank. The thing is, like the world titles, the way they were set up as of last year. So you had like Seth Rollins with the uh, the, the 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 world heavyweight championship that was still new at the time. So it's not as if that was going to change hands, uh, like in the moment, or at least you know surrounding the pay per view. Uh, of course, nobody was going to beat Roman Reigns with that money in the bank. So you're sort of between a rock and a hard place. They're just now getting around to the idea that Seth Rollins might lose this title come WrestleMania. I kind of feel like we're getting to the point where Damian Priest has got to do something with that money in the bank. And I kind of feel like given that they were setting up a lot of stuff between him and Drew McIntyre, maybe once Drew McIntyre wins at WrestleMania, Damian Priest can sort of do his thing. Or if Rock is insistent that that title come off of Seth Rollins, as he was sort of implying in his promo or just sort of st stating outright, maybe Priest can get in line with the bloodline or, or join up in league with the bloodline because this stuff with the, with the Judgment Day, I don't know how much longer it's going to last. They seem to always be teasing that they're on the verge of breaking up. A lot can happen between now and then, but I really don't know. I, once that title comes off of Seth Rollins, it's sort of everything's up in the air. I feel like Damian Priest can cash in, who's a bad guy, can cash in on another bad guy, Drew McIntyre, and it all kind of makes sense. I think the crowd would kind of go nuts for it regardless because it's a cash in, but the idea of two bad guys, you know, sort of at war over that title is also kind of interesting, and I think it's something that they wouldn't be afraid of to play around with, especially I'll be honest with you, since Drew McIntyre is getting a lot of good reactions these days with his sort of troll character now, but everybody else in that match, save for maybe LA Knight, nobody's going to be in a better situation than Damian Priest is right now. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a long time. He's had that briefcase now since July. That's a long time. We're coming up on July in about four months, um, which is kind of a long time, but kind of not a long time. I feel like once that title is off Seth, which will probably happen at WrestleMania, maybe we'll end up loosening up that title a little bit and Damian Priest will be able to cash in. And maybe people will start seeing him as a world heavyweight champion once he's world heavyweight champion, because I know a lot of y'all don't see that right now. 
E. David Bruce says, with MJF out of commission for now, Sammy drawing negative heat, Jack Perry serving time, <laughs> serving time in New Japan, and Darby Allen nowhere near the main event scene, would you consider the four pillars kind of a dud? Hmm. Look, I think the four pillars was a decent hook for like the early days of AEW when uh, you wanted something to signify that not only are we bringing in people who are established, but we're also setting up our future. There's no way you can guarantee certain people are going to be the future of your company. Swerve wasn't even in AEW back then. You got these high profile indie names. I look MJF clearly, I mean, clearly you can't consider MJF a dud. He's like a building piece for the company. He's probably signed an extension or a new deal with the company. I don't know what she's doing back there. All this talk about the pillars, huh? Gypsy bug. Anyways, um, Jack Perry, I'll be honest with you. I haven't given up hope on Jack Perry. I know a lot of people have, but he is serving time in New Japan right now. And it, when he comes back, he's going to be getting a lot of heel heat. They keep on trying to give us Sammy as a good guy. That ain't going to happen. And Sammy's wrestling, while it's really good, it's not like you can't find that in other people in the company. So they've got to do something with Sammy's character that makes people give a damn about him because I don't really think people do. That being said, he's still a really terrific wrestler. People were going crazy for his match against Hobbs uh, two weeks ago. So, you know, I don't know if you'd consider Sammy a dud necessarily, but he's also not the kind of guy who you're going to see as like a top level guy, at least anytime soon. I kind of feel like Darby Allen could be a top level guy sooner than later, especially given how well the Sting's last match went off just here to, at Revolution. Um, so I don't know. Remains to be seen about Jack Perry. Kind of remains to see, be seen about Sammy. But obviously none of those guys are the major future pieces like Osprey, like Takeshita. MJF clearly is, though. So I don't know. I think a lot of people like to look at the four pillars as like, oh, man, they kind of all suck. When really that's not the case. I think Darby's run with Sting has been really special. And I hope they do a lot of really cool things with Darby, you know, going forward. But uh, but yeah, clearly their main dudes that they're focusing on now, it's like none of those guys, maybe one of them is MJF. Braden Loader says, Steve, with WrestleMania just around the corner, what's been your favorite WrestleMania stage? So I was at 33. Three in Orlando, and they had that giant roller coaster there. And I thought the stage was really, really cool and really elaborate. I really didn't like being there at WrestleMania because the show, our tickets were just terrible. It was back when they were doing that long ass six, seven hour WrestleMania thing on one day. And I don't know, the show itself really wasn't all that great. The Hardys came back, and that was kind of cool. I was kind of over it, to be honest with you. But the actual stage was really cool. I thought it was really awesome. I thought last year's Hollywood Oscars-inspired thing was pretty cool, too. Um, yeah, prob I'll be honest with you, probably the roller coaster. I thought that thing looked really cool. I was like, my goodness, this looks like a legitimate roller coaster. It wasn't, but I thought it was pretty cool. I like this question. Daywalker says, will there be another dark character like the likes of The Undertaker or Bray Wyatt? Should that stuff be left alone out of respect? for Bray for a while, or does it just not belong in wrestling anymore? I don't know, man. I kind of feel like that kind of stuff still has a role in wrestling. Uh, you just got to get it. You, it just has to be done well. Bray was such a unique guy, performer, creative mind. It's hard to come across people like that. I feel, um, but I don't think they should, I don't think out of respect for Bray, they should stay away from characters who sort of explore the supernatural stuff, but they're really difficult to do. I feel like they kind of want to do that with Joe Gacy, but it's just not really working. So now he's just sort of crazy guy, but it'll be interesting to see how main roster handles him because I think there's a possibility that Joe Gacy can be that guy. Maybe, maybe. 
Eastside Reviews has a great question here. He says, I've been rewatching every Mania, and it's been an interesting experience seeing the different trends and such. My question is, who do you think has had the biggest fall off from Mania to Mania? He suggests King Kong Bundy, of course, main evented two. I don't know what he was doing in three, but it probably wasn't too special. Uh, or Nakamura, who, of course, was uh, fighting for the WWE Championship in 2018. And then by 2019, I don't know, was that when he was with Boogs or something? I don't know. Um, and I think that was I think that was before Boogs. Oh, man. So I, I looked at this and I think these are probably the best answers probably the best answers. Um, the only other one that I thought was an interesting one, not necessarily that it was a fall off, but it was an inter it was an interesting trajectory. It was an interesting journey. Would have of course been Jinder Mahal who right after WrestleMania 30, 2017, 2018, whatever it was, um, won the title. And then by the next, I think it's at 33, right after 33 won the title and then by the time 34 rolled around, he was like winning the U.S. title at WrestleMania. He'd already been champion and within a year had already fallen down to the United States title scene. And I don't even know where he was the Mania after that. I suspect he probably wasn't even on the card. I could be wrong about that, but I, I probably think I'm right about that. Um, so Jinder Mahal had a, had a, has had a weird experience Mania to Mania in that like he just sort of had this You'd think if you just watched the WrestleManias, oh, this guy had a pre-show bit with Gronk. Uh, he came in like he almost won the Andre the Giant Battle Royal, didn't quite do it. And then in the next Mania, he was, you know, like winning the U.S. title. You think that guy's on the ascent? Nah, nah. That guy had already fallen off to mid-card title. Um, and then he like totally disappeared after that. So I don't know. I think Jinder Mahal had, had an interesting one. Steven Andrews says, I'm probably too late, but I'm meaning to ask you this for a while. Whenever a new wrestling logo or t-shirt drops, it's always one of my favorite things when you give your opinion on it, knowing you're a designer like me. I was wondering if you ever thought about doing videos on here where you redesign terrible wrestling logos or t-shirts. I've never thought about that. I think he continues on to say that he'd be interested in that. I don't know how many of you out there would be interested in that. I do plan this week on doing a WWE shop merchandise uh, review to see what new designs are out there. If they've improved it all, we got WrestleMania coming up. So let's take a look at the WrestleMania merch. It's probably all crap, probably all boring. Um, but I don't know. I, you know, I, I've been working on some new merchandise for the friendo shop.com, some new wrestle juice merchandise, some new friendo club merchandise, but like taking somebody else's idea and then reconfiguring it, Seems like a cool idea, but I don't know if it's really up the alley of this channel. But uh, but I don't know. Maybe, you never know. You never know. Maybe. Maybe. Alex Ari Arai says, what's a good life advice you wish somebody told you when you were younger? Keep up the awesome content. So uh, over at uh, what our bonus episodes for Friendo Club, the, the Friendo cast, me and Larson do a bonus, a weekly bonus episode. And we actually talked about this pretty extensively a couple of weeks ago, but I'll give you, I'll give you uh, like a short version. And I never understood, I'll put it this way. I never, two things. Number one, I never truly understood the power of networking when I was younger. I can't complain as far as like where I'm at career wise. I'm way happier than I ever thought I could possibly be. Uh, so I can't complain too much, but I feel like a lot of my failures earlier in life when it came to, you know, trying to publish comic books, for example, uh, or even, you know, out of college, my expectations for my own career probably fell short because I, I underestimated the, the power of networking, like and how important that is um, to, you know, advancing your career. So probably that. And also just like, I would have told myself how to handle money better. I was never really good at like saving or investing or anything like that. You know, you get you make money and you spend it and you make more. Uh, that was my philosophy back then. So I probably would have told myself to be a bit more careful with money and, uh, and to learn how to network better because networking, I'll be honest with you, I don't care what the career is. Networking is everything. It really is. Kyle Miller says, does Steve miss his work as movie voice guy? I remember calling him when I was young, telling him, <laughs> him telling me when Forrest Gump was going to play at my AMC. 
I actually was the automated voice for a credit union that I used to work for. It was a bank that I used to work for. And they were like, hey, Steve, uh, you, you, you're the, uh, you have a good voice. You want to come do the automated system here? Because it was like a smaller credit union. So like, okay. And so, uh, so yeah, I used to be the voice that you would hear when you would call. And then when you'd ask to hit, like, I want to talk to like an actual banker. When, I, when they would get to me, they would be really confused because then the automated system guy would just be talking to them. <laughs> Here we go. Razvan says, hello from Romania. Follower of Going In Raw from around 2016. Always can count on you guys to lift my spirit up. My question. Uh, in my opinion, the big gold belt is the best design of a title ever. But if you were in charge of designing a new title for WWE, how would it look? I'll tell you what. I actually really do like the network design logo. Like what Roman has right now, I think is actually pretty decent. I'm not a fan of like the color and texture scheme. So it'd be the same thing, but it would be like a bunch of different series. It would be like, I don't know, like gunmetal and pewter. And like, it would look like grays and blacks and like maybe some like tarnished silver and then like where the red, you know, slashes through the logo, that would be like a striking red, like a really bright, you know, uh, awesome looking red, maybe like a bunch of jewels or some shit like that. That's what I would do because I like the basic design of the current WWE Undisputed title. Like the World Heavyweight title, I think looks pretty good. I like it. It's fine. It's sort of an homage to the big gold belt, but it's not the big gold belt. Um but I really like the network logo title. I think it's a fine title. I think that the color scheme and the texture scheme, that's what I would change. I would make it look more like it came out of uh, like Star Wars. Like, you know, how that, the, like the, uh, all the shit in Star Wars just looks like it's tarnished. You know, it's distressed. That's what I would make it look like. Money Mike Production says, with Tony Khan now talking about expanding to nine to 10 pay-per-views a year, I see this backfiring on Tony without a streaming deal. If you're Tony Khan, would you work on a deal to put all pay-per-views on Max or rebrand Honor Club streaming service in the old WWE Network built for AEW and Ring of Honor? I feel like right now it doesn't seem to be broke. So if he can expand to 9 to 10 pay-per-views a year and still charge 50 bucks, like his I don't think his pay-per-view numbers have been hit all that much. Like he's been able like Revolution I I expect to do a pretty good number. They got this new pay-per-view dynasty coming up. And people are going to plunk down 50 bucks for that. Maybe it's not going to be as much as it used to be across the board. Maybe the big four pay-per-views are still going to do all those big numbers. I don't know how the Forbidden Door is going to shake out. Yeah, you got CMLL in there and New Japan, but like a lot of the, the New Japan stars are coming over to AEW. So like, what is that going to look like? Um, so I look, I'm not Tony Khan. If I was... I'm sure he is trying to put together a deal to get onto Max. I think he's probably trying to do that. He talked recently about increases in the cable TV rights. Um, Rebrand Honor Club streaming service in the old WWE Network built for AEW and Ring of Honor. I feel like the infrastructure there is just too much. And why would he do that when it seems kind of obvious that he'll get a streaming deal sooner than later? Wouldn't shock me by the end of this year if all that stuff was streaming on Max. I mean, they're building out like a new sports app or some shit like that. Maybe he can cut a deal for that. I don't know. But, you know, what he's doing right now seems to be working. If he gets these TV rights increases, then the company's going to be profitable this year. You know, like, I don't know what else what else you could even want. When people talk about, oh, man, should AW just, are they going to fold? They're not going to fold. Like, if you look at the Wednesday Dynamite numbers, they haven't fallen. Like they sort of remain just around 800 between 800 and 900,000. Um, I'm sure TNT is probably happy with that. I know like originally the estimates or, you know, the, the ask for that was like 500,000. So if you're almost doubling that number and it hasn't dropped off significantly over the past two years, they're, they're in pretty good shape. They are in pretty good shape. That makes me happy because it's more stuff for us to watch. It's more stuff for us to enjoy. And more than that, it's more paychecks for wrestlers out there. More exposure for wrestlers on cable television. Uh, Jalen Legrant here says, uh, not a question, but imagine how they're going to explain Stone Cold existing without McMahon seems impossible. 
I don't know at this point necessarily that WWE would need to feature the backstory of Steve Austin on their current programming. I don't see that as being like a necessity. So, I mean, the document, I don't think they're, look, I don't think they're going to scrub like I'm sure Stone Cold Steve Austin has a documentary on Peacock, right? I don't think they're going to edit that or scrub Vince McMahon out of that. I don't think they're going to scrub Vince McMahon out of their programming. So I don't know that that's going to be necessarily an issue, them having to explain how Stone Cold is Stone Cold. Will they be able to celebrate the history of Stone Cold on their programming if an opportunity arises, like an anniversary or something? Probably not. I do not see Vince McMahon being on their television programming even in flashback form at any time, anytime soon. Um, they've got this new crop of talent uh, that sort of has existed without storyline Vince McMahon. And I don't think they need to worry about having Vince McMahon, even in flashbacks on their programming. Adam S messenger says any chance we could watch you doing a 2k 24 GM mode playthrough on the Twitch channel when it comes out. Yes, there is that possibility. Uh, Larson, and I need to sort of figure out the logistics of it, but I know, you know, we do want to do some stuff using 2K24. Whether or not we're able to find the time to do it, it's kind of up in the air. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe if we can get that Thursday night slot back on our Twitch channel, I'm kind of expecting to sort of do some stuff on my personal Twitch channel again with 2K24, at least in the short term. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out long term, but yeah, I think you'll see some 2K24 content somewhere in the Friendo Club umbrella, whether it's here, over on the Twitch, uh, my Twitch, our Twitch, whoever's Twitch. It's going to be somewhere. We're going to do something with it. We're not just going to leave it alone. Ken Sky says, do you think Cody being on the cover of 2K24 is any indication on whether the Rock and Roman story was planned from the beginning or not? She is on one today. She is absolutely on one today uh no i don't i think that 2k probably probably just because i just i man i don't i just don't know that they're number one i think that some of the cody finishing his story stuff is built into like the my right the the uh, my career my rise stuff um i mean look man cody was the, the safest bet to win the rumble like I don't, I know that I think I picked CM Punk to win the Rumble, <laughs> but I think by the end I went with Cody. Um, but like, he, this is who's talking about finishing his story so much. I don't know what kind of communication there is between like Triple H and the people at 2K24. I get the feeling he wants to keep that stuff really close and on the down low. And if you communicate that stuff to video game marketing people, man, I don't know. I don't know if you can keep that stuff under wraps. I get the feeling maybe at most they went to WWE and said, hey, would it be appropriate for us to do the Cody finishing the story story and feature that on the game? And then they were like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And then that's pr probably it. I doubt that they would be privy to like the, uh, the, you know, the ins and outs of it. So, I mean, in that case, yeah, I think maybe, I, I don't know about the rock Roman story. No, I don't think the rock Roman story because rock didn't even sign on until January. So, but I get the feeling that Cody was always planned on, on winning the rumble and always planned on finishing his story at this year's WrestleMania. And they probably asked triple H, Hey, is, is it cool if we do like a finishing the story thing? And he's probably like, yeah, we're not going to bury him anytime soon. J on a says, will we, ever be able, will we ever be able to taste wrestle juice? Have you ever thought about a drink of some kind as a form of merchandise, a coffee blend, a tea blend, or an energy drink? I don't know. Never thought about well, that's not that's a lie. I've thought about it. I've looked into it very very briefly. I don't even remember what I came across, uh, but uh, I don't know. Anything's possible. I don't know how many people want to drink something called Wrestle Juice though. All right, man. We're gonna end this episode of Ask Wrestle Juice with a Star Trek question from John O. Davies. Says, Hey Steve, with your love for Star Trek Discovery, where would you rank Michael Burnham in the pantheon of Starfleet captains? Power rank your top five in order. Wow. Okay. All right. My top five Starfleet captains. Boy, oh boy. Uh, I am going to go with, man, man. All right. I'm going with Cisco number one. <laughs> Cisco's number one. Picard's number two. 
I'd probably put Strange New Worlds Pike number three. Man, I do love Michael Burnham, though. But Burnham also has only gone through like one solid year as a captain. Burnham was kind of a mess, like just straight up committed a, uh, what is it called, a mutiny, and then went to prison and then had to work her way back up. So I don't know if she did top five. We got Cisco. We got Picard. Um, I'll put Pike in there. Uh, I'd probably put Janeway next. Uh, and then, and then, and then prob probably Kirk after that, probably Kirk after that Burnham might be sitting here at number six, Burnham might be sitting at number six, but only because we have such a small sample size from her, man, if, if, if discovery ended up going seven seasons, maybe I'd have to reevaluate one person that definitely is not in the top five or top 10. Because I would find other captains to put in the top 10 before I put Jonathan Archer anywhere near the top Starfleet captains. He is not allowed in that because Enterprise is such a dog shit show. That's going to do it for WrestleJuice. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. I appreciate it. Th this, is a, this is an abject, this is an absolute disaster over here. What are you doing over there? What are you doing, Mom? What are you doing, Mom? <laughs> 